right. What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? How we doing tonight? Hope you guys are enjoying this this sweet, calming music. Let me know, of course, as always, if the music is too loud, if you can't hear me or anything, and we'll we'll take care of it right away. But I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. I uh, took a, about a week off. I uh, was feeling a little under the weather last week and uh, kind of tried to take it easy a little bit on Monday and Tuesday. And then I just kind of scrambled on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, trying to catch up with all my, my regular work. Uh, and so we didn't stream on uh, on Saturday this past week. And so the models that we're going to be covering tonight are all models that we did really two weeks ago. Um, I mean, a week and a half ago, I guess you could say. So uh, what's up, Slayer of Osiris? Great to see you in here. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve, for the uh, check and Nuno for the check. Glad to hear that the audio is good. So let's get into it here. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is what's called a Model Monday Live Solve. Um, and this is actually one of the models I just mentioned a moment ago. Uh, this is the wedge bracket model, but let me just roll back here just a little bit. Uh, my name is Too Tall Toby, and I'm excited to be your host tonight, as always. And what these models tonight represent are challenges that we do uh, on Model Monday Live, which we're actually hosting on Saturdays now. So Saturday mornings at uh, 1500 GMT, which is 10 o'clock AM East Coast time. Uh, you know, maybe different, obviously, in your time zone. Uh, we challenge people. And on these Saturdays, uh, the points, you know, in this case, the points were live. And what those points get you is they get you onto a leaderboard. So if you're here for the first time tonight, welcome. If you're watching the recording, welcome. And uh, you can check out this leaderboard at twotalltoby.com on the tab that says Model Monday Live. And so you can see here's what the updated leaderboard actually looks like. So we got seven people on here. Uh, Tom Smith, former Model Mania champion at SolidWorks World. Tim Z, he won Model Mania at 3D Experience World, formerly SolidWorks World this year. So we got some real elites on this board, but we also have uh, some, some other super strong users here on this board. I think it's going to be a great tournament, and that tournament I'll talk about a little bit more later in the presentation. Uh, but if you haven't had a chance yet, be sure to tune in on Saturday mornings where you can be challenged to do these models. And um, the models that we do, we, we always use the same material. We always use the same density. Uh, we always use the same unit systems. Uh, but I like to post this slide just in case, again, if you're here for the first time or if you haven't uh, done the Saturday challenge before, you know, this gives you the opportunity to kind of grab a screen capture of this so you can make your own templates. You know, me, I use SolidWorks, but maybe if you're using a different CAD system, hey, it's all good. As long as you can make a custom material and use these densities, well, you're going to be able to come up with the correct mass. And in fact, we've had people in here before that do Fusion 360 or Onshape or X Design. You know, any you know, lots of other CAD packages out there. I think SolidWorks is the best personally. Uh, I'm a little bit biased because I've been using it for so long, but uh, you know, you could certainly use any CAD system that you like. All right, so. Uh, with that, let's take a look at some of these models here that we did on Saturday. Now, if you if you weren't here uh, two Saturdays ago, because uh, we didn't we didn't go live this past Saturday, so I think this was back on the sixth. Uh, if you weren't here on the the live event and you want to take a screen capture of this, feel free to do so. I'll jump this over to full screen. Rodrigo says he thought he thought he missed Saturday. No, you don't. No worries, Rodrigo. It was me. It was me who missed Saturday. And I see 3167 is here as well. Longtime friend of the show. What's up, 3167? Thanks for tuning in. So if you're here for the first time or if you're watching this in the recording, maybe you want to take a screen capture of this. It, you know, like I said, if you're watching this in the recording, maybe you just want to pause the video and give this thing a try. You know, see how you would model something like this. See if you run into any challenges. <laughs> 3167 pointing out my other bias uh, towards SolidWorks. Yes, it's very true. You're very... Uh, thanks for blowing up my spot, bro. <laughs> so again, if if uh, hopefully that's enough time for you. I mean, even if you want to just take a screen capture, if you just want to follow along with what I'm doing tonight. But what I'm going to do tonight, just like I advertised in the thumbnail, uh, you're going to have a chance to see how an expert would think through this challenge. So with that, let's jump into it here. I'm going to move this challenge here over onto my other monitor. So whenever you see me look over here, I'm looking over at the print. Um, one thing that I often talk about when I go through and do these challenges, and we've been doing them for a few weeks, so I'm going to kind of, um, you know, up the uh, 
uh, up my game a little bit here. Maybe I won't quite go into into depth on all the basics, but one thing that I do always cover is whenever you look at a 3D model, and, and you could even look at it in a view like this, you want to think to yourself, kind of how how am I going to unbuild this model? You know, for a model like this, what I would probably do is I would start out with a rectangular base here. Um, you know, depending on what dimensions are available, but I just think it makes sense. So a rectangular base, extrude that up to this location here. Um, and then I would probably create this kind of wedge shape on the back as my second feature, because I noticed that this tombstone is running right into that wall. So I'd, I'd kind of make the tombstone so it can easily run into that wall for that wedge shape. Um, then I would finish off by creating this kind of raised area here with the cut extrude, and then that's pretty much it. I mean, this isn't a very uh, complicated model compared to some of the other ones that we've we've done, but there's still always lessons to learn. And, you know, I think this is... Uh, this is really a shout out for me to all the students that are out there that uh, maybe are just learning SolidWorks and kind of want to see how an experienced user thinks through a model like this and then actually goes through and, and creates the model. So if you know anybody like that, if you know any students out there, if you know anybody who's just learning the software, be sure to share this video with them, share a link to this recording, and uh, you know let them know that we do this every Saturday with live challenges, and then every Monday we kind of do like an answer key for those, uh, for those students. All right, so I'm going to move this over to my other monitor here. Let's start a new part here. Material is 1060 alloy, and uh, units are MMGS. And I haven't, I haven't, you know, modeled this or even really looked at it since uh, two Saturdays ago. So who knows? Maybe I'll get surprised by something on this print. Uh, so here, what I'm doing is, as always, um, I begin with a new sketch uh, by, you know. Kind of going back to my game plan. So in my game plan, I said I'm going to start on the top plane. I don't go up here to my sketching toolbar or anything like that. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times in the tutorials, what it teaches us is you click the sketch command first, and then you pick a plane. I don't do that either. Um, I just think it makes more sense, and it's it's uh, more applicable in a variety of different situations to click on the plane or the planar face where you want to sketch, and then click the sketch icon. It shows up right here on this list. It just you know it just goes a lot smoother. You don't have to worry about what toolbar you're on or anything like that. Like the way that this model started here is I did new. I picked my 1060 M MMGS uh, template. I click top plane and I click sketch. And you notice I'm on the features toolbar up here. Like the features toolbar is what's active up here. Um, but it doesn't matter. SolidWorks is smart enough to know that as soon as I click on this plane and go into sketch mode that, you know, I'm going to end up automatically switching to my sketching tools up top there. Not that it really matters. I mean, when you get good enough with the software, you don't even really lean on these toolbars too much. But it is kind of cool to know that as soon as I go into sketch mode here, boom, it puts me right onto the sketch plane. So now I can just come out onto the screen and then I'm going to press S on my keyboard. Now, one thing that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned tonight is that I don't really customize SolidWorks that much. Like S is an out of the box shortcut. Um, I do cu I customize the S key menu. And I talk about that in a video that I made. So if you just go and you look at my Power Moves video or even just search my YouTube channel for S key, you'll find out how I customize this S key. Uh, but other than that, I really don't use anything other than out of the box shortcut. So any shortcuts that I do, just keep in mind, that's vanilla SolidWorks, it's out of the box SolidWorks. If it's, if it's something that I've customized, I'll tell you, but I haven't customized any key bindings. I just use straight vanilla out of the box SolidWorks aside from the S key. So uh, with that being said, let me go here to um, my rectangle command. I'm gonna single click on the point of origin for this thing. It doesn't really matter where the origin is for this one. I mean, you know, you, you need it to be at a corner where you can easily uh, sketch this one, or sorry, where you can easily sketch this 40 by 135 rectangle. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't really matter where you put the origin. I mean, I think I'll probably put it here. Uh, sorry, I'll probably put it here just because it would be kind of awkward to have it here, like in the middle of the part. You either want everything to be centered or you want to kind of step off a corner. It makes it a little bit easier when you're setting it up for machining as well. Uh, so, you know, a little bit nuanced there with that decision. But here we go. Single click, move my mouse, let go of my mouse. So I single clicked, I move my mouse, I let go of my mouse. And then I'm going to type in uh, 40, enter, 135, enter, S key, extrude. Now, this is something that I added to the S key menu was the extrude command, so I can jump right into extrude from sketch mode. Let go of my mouse again. Come over here, type in the height of that extrusion, which in this case is a height of 19. Enter once to update the preview. Enter again to finish that command. And there we go. We've, we've created our first feature, fully defined sketch to the dimensions that were specified. 
Uh, next feature over here is the wedge shape. So select a face, begin a sketch. So this is just like when we pick our plane from the tree and we begin a sketch. Here we pick a planar face and we begin a sketch. And another little trick to know about SolidWorks, um, if you're ever, you know, you, you kind of learn some things to look for over time. But if you're a beginner and you're wondering um, which mode you're in, because really there's four modes in SolidWorks, right? There's drawing mode, there's assembly mode. Then when you're in part mode, you're either at the feature level or you're at the sketch level. And a lot of times for beginners, it's confusing. Well, what makes it really easy is the red origin. You will only ever see the red origin when you're in sketch mode. If you're not in sketch mode, you won't see the red origin. So it's kind of another little like indicator you can look for. So if I pick this face and I begin a sketch, you'll notice here the red origin shows up. If I wasn't in sketch mode, that wouldn't show up. If I exit sketch mode, no red origin. So it's just another little indicator you can look for. Um, there's a couple other things you can look for too, like the confirmation corner up here or on a new sketch, it shows up underneath the uh, um, uh, rollback bar. But you can turn those things off. Um, if you're editing a sketch, it doesn't do that. So, you know, this one is like a sure thing. You can always look there for that red origin. All right, so S key line, and this is going to be a line that maybe goes up like so. Uh, it goes up to a distance of 126. And uh, then I can kind of come off of that end point to make like an arc, but I don't want the arc to go tangent that way. I want it to be tangent to the perpendicular so I can make an arc like this. Um, if you weren't sure about that or if you didn't know that shortcut, you could just manually sketch in that arc there. So three-point arc here, like so. And then what you'd want to do is take this center point, hold control, take this point here, and you'd want to lock those together. Now, this is one of these spots where a lot of times in a drawing, they, they won't make it clear. I tried to make it really clear on this one. So you can see that what I did was I created the radius here, and I have the end point of the radius coming right to that edge of the wedge. And... That's something that you, you want to look for. When people are, are making drawings and they're doing a good job with drawings, they'll they'll do their best to make that clear. Like, for example, this radius 21 here, I could have made this a radius 21 like this, right? This could have come off like so and said radius 21, and then there could have been an arrow like so. The problem is that if you do it that way, you're not really confirming that the tombstone and the through hole are concentric to one another. Um, by doing it this way, by having the, the center of the radius come right from the center of that hole, it really kind of clears up any possible ambiguity with regards to that tombstone. Because, you know, the tombstone could come up like so, and then the hole could be like down here, right? And, and when the, that's a tight, like when that's one millimeter difference, you know, it can get confusing pretty quick. And so this is something that you can do to help out your coworkers, to help out people downstream who are going to be machining your parts. You know, just, just kind of, when you make the radius, make it pretty clear that it's coming from the center. I don't know if that's officially a best practice. Um, that's a, a practice that I used to use a lot when I worked a lot with a shop. Um, but, you know, you have to use your best judgment, kind of decide how you're going to use that tip. Don't ever look to me as like your... Uh, uh, drawings guru. That's that's definitely not my role. I'm your 3D modeling guru. Uh, but uh, as far as drawings, I don't have nearly as much experience there. A lot of what I was doing was just make a drawing, get it to the shop, uh, let them machine it, or make a drawing, um, get it over to the 3D printer. You know, that's it. Well, not to the 3D printer, actually. That wouldn't make sense. <laughs> get, it, get a drawing, <laughs> send it to the shop. That was mainly what I did. Uh, okay, all right, so... What I was trying to say there was make a model and just hand the model off to the 3D printer, not make a drawing. I try to do too many things at once. All right, so here we go. So we're going to fully define this sketch. We always want our sketches to be black. If they're not black and you're not sure why, grab a point and move it around. So, for example, if I had created a dimension here for the angle of this wedge and that angle was 35 millimeters, and then I was to take this blue point here and drag it around, I can see, oh, the sketch isn't fully defined. And the reason it's not fully defined is because I didn't lock down my horizontal distance here. So if I take this point and this point and put those in at a dimension of three millimeters, all right, now the thing is, is all black. You know, similarly, if it, if it was blue like this, just grab a blue point, move the blue point around. Oh, okay, this line isn't horizontal. It's supposed to be horizontal. Take that, make it horizontal. Now the sketch goes black. So just if a sketch isn't black, grab a blue point, move it around. S key, boss extrude here. This is going to go out to a depth of 22 millimeters. Enter, enter. That's a, a great shortcut to learn. 
Okay, now we have the tombstone shape, and uh, I don't normally do this. Normally what I would do with the tombstone shape is I would take uh, the right plane, put my mouse over the border, hold control, drag, and then I would let go of control, and then I would type in the distance for that plane, so 21. Or similarly, I would pick this face here, and then I would press the S key and go reference geometry plane, and then I would... Um, go to a distance of 21 enter and i would flip offset there and create a plane at that location okay so that's just kind of a quick little uh, plane creation tool to get this tombstone boss location at 21 millimeters offset so you can see it's 21 millimeters offset then it extrudes to a depth of 20 millimeters but i'm going to do something a little different here tonight uh, just to show you guys another another option you could use and that is to offset the sketch before you extrude it. So in other words, I could create that sketch here on this face. So select a face, begin a sketch, uh, maybe orient your view on this one, go into the tombstone command. So line, single click, come over to this point, single click, move up. Uh, that distance is coming from the bottom of the print. So I can't put it in right now. Uh, come across like so, let go of my mouse, type in the radius of that 21. Bring my mouse the rest of the way over here to this line, single click, close off that sketch, and then jump into smart dimension. So S key, smart dimension, smart dimension here to this height of 46. Now I can go to S key extrude. And then here in this menu, and, and just to help things not be confusing, I'm going to just start out by reversing the direction and putting in the depth here. So that's a depth of 20. I can go up to the top here and say, don't extrude from the sketch plane, but extrude from an offset distance. Now, this has been in the software for a long time, uh, but it's something that I probably don't use enough, uh, to put, put it that way. And so maybe you didn't know about it. Maybe you just kind of were like, no, I don't even know what this is. I don't care about this. But basically, it just lets you, when you go to do your offset, it lets you skip that step of creating the plane. I'm sorry, when you go to do your extrude, it lets you skip that step of creating the plane. So you can see here, I could offset this at like 21 millimeters. And you can see uh, what the result is. Actually, why is my preview not updating? There we go. So you can see what the result is there. And that's actually what we want. And it saves us having to make that additional plane. So now the tree is a little bit more clean and I didn't have to make that extra plane. So, you know, it's it's kind of a cool thing to know about. Um, something that, like I said, I I don't use it enough. I like I personally like having the planes there just because it makes it a little bit easier for me to see what's going on. Uh, but in this case, what I would probably do is I would call this thing Tombstone, and then I would just put a little note in it that says, like, Offset uh, Sketch Plane, something like that. So I would know as soon as I look at the tree that, that that feature was created with, you know, kind of a special feature built into it. So now, uh, cut extrude through all. This is a this is a workflow everybody should know. You guys should definitely be practicing this one. Pick a face, begin a sketch, orient my view, S key circle, wake up the center point, drop the circle in here, bring that out to the di diameter, 19, enter, S key, extrude cut, right mouse button, through all, right mouse button. That's like something that you do often enough that you should definitely get fast at going through those steps. It's, that's one that... You just want to keep practicing, practicing, practicing. You do it all day long. You know, look for, you know, what's probably the fastest workflow. It's probably something like what I just did there. Here, I'll control Z and I'll control Z again and control Z out of it. So again, just to go through it again, pick a face, begin a sketch, S key, circle, hold your mouse over the arc to wake up the center point, single click on the center point, move your mouse away, let go of your mouse, 19, enter, S key, extrude cut, right mouse button through all right mouse button again you're doing those cut extrude holes all day long may as well learn a quick workflow where in just a matter of seconds you can tear through and create that feature and so now finally uh we've got that kind of slotted region um this one you know i would i would definitely do it in two features uh, rather than trying to do it all in one I'm not even sure if you could do it all in one actually you probably could you could probably figure out a way uh, so here, when I go to make the slot, I can never get the slots to have the dimensions added. So I'll just do it in two steps here. So this one has a radius of 14. And that's going to be collinear to this edge. I probably would take the time to rotate the model and pick this edge just because I'm, I'm kind of uh, neurotic like that. Or if you really want to like make sure that this thing is, is not going to blow up if the wedge moves, you go back to this earlier sketch here. You right mouse button on the sketch and you say show. And so you can see the sketch down there at the bottom and you take that sketch line and you hold control and you take this 
uh, this line here and you make those collinear. And what you're what you're doing there is you're setting yourself up so that if this gets filleted or if the wedge goes away, you're not relying on this edge ID or this edge ID here. You're relying on the original sketch, which is going to be pretty solid. Um, I remember Ed Eaton mentioned that uh, in a recent presentation that I saw, and I was like, yeah, that's a great tip. Uh, that's definitely one that I also use a lot. Uh, a lot of times when I teach my students, I say, like, the further up the tree you can go, uh, probably the more reliable the geometry is going to be. Uh, but also, you know, referencing to an absorbed sketch is a, a solid pro move. Okay, so now S key, smart dimension from this edge to this arc to grab the center point of that arc. That one's at 26. And then smart dimension from this edge of the model to the arc here. Okay, that grabs the center point as well, 26. S key extrude. That's going to come up to a height of 3 millimeters. Enter, enter. Select the face, begin a sketch, orient the view. Uh, this is going to be a slotted hole from center point to center point. So very similar to what we did with the cut extrude hole. And then this is going to come out to a distance of 14. Let's see if it works. Nope, it doesn't work. i got to go and add it in. I know there's a check mark for add dimension, so I wonder if maybe if I just tick that on, that'll help. S key extrude cut, right mouse button through all, and right mouse button. That should finish up that model. We give it kind of the final spin around to look at it, see if we missed any features. Look at the, the print here, you know, make sure we didn't lose any features. And then what we can do is we can take a look at our mass properties. So we can go here to evaluate mass properties, and we come up with a uh, a mass here of 615.26 grams and the answer we're looking for here is in three place decimal so we'll call that 615 let's see did we get it correct yes we did it got it correct awesome all right cool so um, I saw a question came in there from Steve, and I thought it was a great question. So is it better to do through all or select an ending face for a hole? Always wanted to know which one is better in the underlying code. So these two are actually kind of, uh, they're, they're more similar uh, than different. Um, so one way that you can kind of visualize that, Steve, is you could go here to, oops, I got mass properties up still you go here to this face begin a sketch orient your view s key circle s key extruded boss uh let's reverse the direction so it's going into the model then right mouse button and say through all so extruded boss through all so here you can see that we have the uh depth of the boss extrusion calculating based on an envelope feature uh, so you can see, you can imagine here that there's an envelope feature. In fact, I think in the newer builds of SolidWorks, you can add that as a reference geometry feature, can't you? If we go here to reference geometry bounding box, boom, we got it. So here I just went into the reference geometry window here and I went to bounding box. Um, and there we go. There's our bounding box. So you can imagine that SolidWorks is dynamically calculating a bounding box for the depth of the model. And if the depth of the model were to change, so for example, if this was to change from 135 to 150 and we rebuild, the bounding box is recalculating and therefore this new circular boss that we created is recalculating. So that is a dynamic end condition. And I would consider that to be very similar to the dynamic end condition of up to surface, where we could say we want to go up to this surface here or up to vertex, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the one that is going to be very different from all of those is going to be blind. Um, and so if we come over here and we do S key extrude cut and we take this extrude, uh, this circle here and we extrude cut it and we say it's going to be blind to 25 millimeters, um, we can see that that is going to blast through the model, but it's actually uh, kind of just stopping uh, abruptly at 25 millimeters, just stopping here. You know, whatever you make the end condition, let's say I drag it out there to 37, it's just stopping there, going out, and then it's stopping there. And so then if we go to this this face here, actually just to do a one-to-one, -one, let me just hold control, and copy this hole. So it's exactly the same size uh, going through the exact same face. And we say edit feature here, and we say uh, make that one through all. So this one I would call a static cut, and this one I would call a dynamic cut. And if we look at our evaluate um, evaluate performance evaluation, and we really dig down into those features, we'll find that 
the static cut does solve slightly more rapidly than the dynamic cut. Um, you know, obviously on this computer uh, and with how simple that geometry is, it's not that much of a difference. But first of all, this is a great tool to be aware of um, that you can go in here to evaluate and go to performance evaluation. So that's here on your, let me see if I move this over a little. That's here on your evaluate toolbar. Um, and second of all, we can see that when you do have a dynamic end feature, it's going to take longer to rebuild. Uh, so, you know, which one is better? Well, what's better is when you make a change to your model, the whole model doesn't blow up, right? That's what's better. Um, what's better is not ending up with a bunch of extra dimensions on your drawing that you don't need when you uh, dynamically import all your dimensions because the static cut is going to have a dimension. Uh, so when you go to make a drawing, you're going to have this extra dimension that you're going to have to delete afterwards, or you're going to have to handle somehow that, you know, 37 millimeters, whatever the depth was of that static cut is going to show up in the drawing when you import your model items. But which one is faster, right? Well, the static cut is going to rebuild faster. If you use them both in a pattern of a thousand instances, well, the static cut one is going to be a way better choice uh, because whenever you do a pattern, the end condition of your features tries to update dynamically along the way. Um, unless you use geometry pattern, of course. Uh, but these are great questions. It's a great question, Steve. And the answer is usually going to be found in performance evaluation. You know, another similar question is, is it better to do a pattern at the sketch level? like make a, a pattern of, of your sketch features, or is it better to make one feature and then do that a, a pattern at the feature level? Well, bring up performance evaluation, you can find out the answer. Um, usually, it's faster to do it at the, uh, at the feature level uh, because complex sketches, you know, more and more sketch entities make for slower geometry, generally speaking. Um, so, but you can find out for sure. You can do kind of your own tests and find out for sure. So thank you for the excellent question. Appreciate that. And Sudarshan says, hello, sir. I'm a big fan of yours. Well, thank you, Sudarshan. I'm a big fan of yours as well. Thanks for tuning in. Glad that you are here. And Mike Puckett, man, certification royalty is here. Says you could have also selected the slot extrude face and clicked offset to avoid having to sketch more geometry. That's a great, a great point, Mike. The problem is that the, the print isn't dimensioned in a friendly way. Uh, so I'd have to do math. So the print is dimensioned with the 14 here and then radius 14. So I'd have to figure out what that offset would be. Uh, but that is a good point. You could always, you could definitely do a sketch with offset. And I think it's always good to look out for those scenarios, especially if that's what the customer wanted, um, because that's going to make it a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Deborah Station says, hey, everybody, just got home from work. All right, let me move this over here. Just go from work. Tacked and welded together some sheet metal projects. I have to go. I have on the go. Uh, they were created on SolidWorks, burned and bent by CNC machines. Fit like a glove. That is an awesome story, Tamper Station. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I just watched a YouTube video this week of a guy who TIG welds. He says, neighbor came over and asked him if he's welding in the garage, and, and the guy thought he was in trouble. And then his neighbor was like, oh, good, because I got a project I need you to do. And he said, that's why you never let your neighbors know that you're a welder. Because they will always have projects for you. So I'm sure you already know that lesson. But Cam's here as well. What's up, Cam? No, you are not late. You are just, you are right on time, as always. Perfect timing. All right, guys, let's take a look at the next challenge here from last, last Saturday. Not this past Saturday, but last, last Saturday. Uh, as always, I just want to remind you, if you guys uh, like this kind of content, and especially if you know anybody who's maybe a little bit newer to SolidWorks, could benefit from watching the way a, a pro kind of thinks through some of these challenges, be sure to share. Please get the word out there. Uh, always appreciate all the new subs. Three challenges tonight. Points are live. You can win all three. Um, actually, when we did this two Saturdays ago, you could only win one. Uh, there was no clean sweep, so that's why we had three different winners. So that first challenge was won by Ivan. Ivan, who actually uh, uh, competed in both of our previous tournaments. And the, the uh, next challenge here, uh, speaking of sheet metal, uh, the next challenge here is a sheet metal challenge. So I called this one Angle 2021 because I didn't want to call it Angle Bracket, but that's really what it is. 
Uh, let me flip over to full screen just in case anybody out there wants to take a screen capture of this. If you want to play along with from home, if you want to be able to follow along with what I'm talking about, I'll leave this up on the screen here just for about another 10 seconds. Tambor Station says he gets that story and he completely agrees. That is awesome. So let's, this is a sheet metal challenge here. We did start doing these sheet metal challenges a few months ago. People really like them. I uh, used to do a lot of sheet metal, mainly progressive die design, and uh, have apparently lost most of my chops. Uh, no, all, all joking aside, it takes me forever to make these prints, and the reason why is because I don't want to be exclusionary, and uh, and I, I want to kind of create these prints in a way that anybody can build them, even if you... Uh, maybe you're not a sheet metal expert, and that certainly introduces its own set of challenges with regards to bend relief. So, please make video all evaluate and mold. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to make a mold. I mean, maybe I'll make a mold design video sometime. I've been kind of dialing it back, uh, Sudar, Sudarshan, uh, on like a, a kind of long form video creation. I've been really focusing on uh, kind of getting build up for the tournament here in may so if, pro if i can do it it'll be later on this year uh, but there's tons of amazing content out there on mold design mold creation if you're not sure where to look maybe just start out by hitting the solidworks youtube channel um, and then you can kind of work out from there but i would just say be sure to hit up youtube for those mold mold design things i didn't i haven't really done that much mold design anyway in my career uh a little bit uh i know enough to to be a little bit dangerous but uh I definitely don't have like a, a PhD in mold design or anything like that. It feels like you need sometimes when you get into crazy, you know, slides and inserts and things. All right, sorry guys, I'm I'm just kind of talking to myself here. <laughs> sheet metal challenges. Where are we gonna start with this thing? I mean, when it's sheet metal uh, and you have the ability to make a bend in the first sketch, you should probably take advantage of that. So for this model, I mean. You know, whenever you look at a 3D print, these are the questions you want to ask. What's my starting plane? What's my starting profile? Is the model symmetric? Can I save some time by doing a mirror all? In the, in the case of this model, the answer is yes. It is symmetric and I can save some time. So probably my first sketch is going to come down here and then bend forward. It's going to be this little like L shape. That was a really good drawing there of an L shape. Uh, then I'm going to uh, extrude it over to the right uh, with sheet metal. And then I'm going to create this bend here along this side. Probably just create it straight uh, and then maybe make the cut extrude. I might include that angle in that, that sidewall sketch. And then I'll finish up with this little flange down here on the bottom. So that's my game plan. You guys have already screen captured the print. So I'm going to move the print over here onto this screen. IPS 1060. Oh, IPS. Come on. MMGS, right? What do you guys like more? Let me know in the chat. You like IPS more or you like MMGS more? Inch, pound, second or... Millimeters, grams, seconds. I'm not sure if we can even bend this thing out of 1060. Meh, whatever. It's just a drawing exercise, right? Yeah, we have a we have a experienced mold designer in the chat, the great Mike Puckett. Uh, he talked about that when he was on the on the show before. I'm gonna have to I think I'm gonna have to probably uh, get Mike back on the show this season and get him to share some of his mold design experience. He could probably teach me quite a few things not probably i'm sure he could hey falconelli what's up man thanks for tuning in great to see you in here that's nice that's good i'm glad i'm glad that this is helpful uh, always ha happy to help all right cool so here we go sheet metal let's let's stick to the game plan here right plane begin a sketch orient the view and our first sketch is going to look something like this a line coming down and a line going over in this direction. And the thing with sheet metal that you, you got to always kind of be aware of is what dimensions is the customer giving you on the print? Uh, so for example, they're giving us this 4.5 dimension. Well, that's 4.5 outside to outside. You know, a lot of times what the customer will give you instead is they'll give you an inside to inside dimension because the goal of this sheet metal is to uh, enclose some type of electronics or they'll, uh, you know, if they're inexperienced when they're making their drawings, they'll just kind of mix and match all over the place. So you really got to pay attention to which side the material is on relative to the dimensions. In the case of this dimension over here, it's four down, it's one over, it's stopping this face here. So whoever made this drawing is clearly a genius when it comes to drawings. Uh, so we're going to go here to four down. Uh, we're going to go one over. So 
So we'll make that guy go four down. We'll come over one here, and we're going to go to Sheet Metal Base Flange Tab. So the very first uh, icon on the Sheet Metal Toolbar is the icon you want to use to create new features from a thin feature sketch. See, normally if you just were to extrude this, you would go Features, you would go Extrude, and you would get what's called a Thin Feature Extrusion. Uh, but we're kind of taking that up a notch by using the sheet metal command base flange tab because now as we go to create this first feature, we can actually uh, incorporate our bend and uh, wall thickness information. So here on the print, it says default wall thickness is 0.125. Default inside bend radius is 0.250. And so we can just input that right here, 0.125, uh, 0.250. Boom, done. And then we can indicate our depth here. And so the depth of this thing is uh, a little bit tricky. Um, the one saving grace here is that it looks like this tab, which is defined at 3.75 inches, is coming directly from this bend region here. So we could probably count on that being correct. Now, if we wanted to do the math, what we would say is that we have a 0.25 radius here and then a 0.125 wall thickness, and a 0.25 radius here, and a 0.125 wall thickness. So that should account for 0.75. So this dimension here of uh, 3.75, if we add 0.75 to that, that should give us the overall width of the part. And if we look down here in the bottom view, we can see that that's what we get. 3.75 plus 0.75 gives us 4.5. So the math works out. We have confirmed that we we uh, we got it correct. So let's let's stick with that. Let's go with that. So here we're going to type in 3.75 for the width, and then we're planning on doing a mirror all at the end. So we're going to do a slash two right in the dimension box. So uh, here in in the dimension dialog box here. Uh, right within the uh, the what's called the property manager, you can see that we can type in 3.75 slash two, and then you can see that SolidWorks calculates that out to 1.875, and we can hit the green check mark and move on. One thing again, just you want to always be aware of this when you're doing sheet metal. Take a look at your preview, and then take a look at your direction of material. So there's a, a check mark here that says reverse direction for the material. Make sure that's going the correct direction. Alrighty, now we're ready to go on to our next feature. So we're going to pick this edge here, and we're going to go up to the sheet metal command called edge flange. So the first feature was taking that that uh, thin sketch and extruding it out. The next feature here is taking this edge and bending it over. So we're going to take this edge and bend it over here, and you can see whenever you do sheet metal um, in a program like SolidWorks in a 3D CAD program, you have the opportunity to define where the bend is originating from. And you can actually see that in a preview here uh, down towards the bottom of the property manager, uh, which we can't see right now because of my keyboard cam. Here it is, flange position. So it's down here kind of towards the bottom of your sheet metal. You have this flange position option. So we could do flange position material inside, which is what we're basically currently on. Uh, we could do one material thickness outside. So material inside, it's flush to the existing face. Sometimes you want that. Uh, the, you know, not There's no one correct answer. It just depends on how the drawing is dimensioned. Uh, one material thickness outside, the full bend on the outside, and then these are more like fringe cases. We don't have to worry about them right now. So that's what we want. We want the full bend to be on the outside. That way we get to our full uh, 4.5 as our overall uh, width of this part. And then whenever you're doing a, a sheet metal flange like this, there's this, this option here, edit flange profile, which is pretty handy. Um, if you click on that option that says edit flange profile, what you can see is that it puts you, SolidWorks puts you into sketch mode. So now at this point, maybe what I would do is a, a control, hold control and I press the number four. That's my, uh, that's my shortcut to get to a right side view. So control in the number one is a front view. Four is a right side view, five is a top view, seven is an isometric view. Uh, a bunch of the other buttons do stuff, but you don't have to worry about them. Just worry about the, the front top right views. Uh, so now you can see I'm looking at this thing from a right side view, and I'm actually editing the sketch of this flange, which makes it really easy for me to actually get in there and create the geometry uh, that's being called out on the print. So in this case, the geometry is saying that it is coming over here to this, uh, this intersection point here, it is at a distance of, I'll go from this line over to this point, 0.375. Again, taking care to note if I'm on the inside or the outside of the material. Uh, it has an angle dimension here of, this looks like 37 degrees. 
and then it has a distance from the sidewall here over to this location at four inches exactly. Okay, and now I can press the S key and go into the trim command. And the way the power trim command works is you hold your mouse down. So I'm, I'm pressing down on the mouse here and then I'm dragging. Hey, see, I get this gray line. This is, this is power trim over here on the left. So you begin dragging, you get this gray line. And then as you drag through things, whoosh, you just snip them away. Whoosh. And by the way, if you go too far like this, see how there's like a, a red dot in the middle of my path? If I go back over that path, it's like, oh, I didn't mean to go that far. Sorry. Went too far. I got a little too crazy. I could even back up through this point and even back up back through this point. So if, you, if you're doing a trim and you're like, yeah, oh, whoa, I went too far. You don't have to like hit escape and undo and go all the way back. You can just, before you let go of your mouse, just go back and hit that point. Then you're good to go. And so you can see now the sheet metal updates. It shows me uh, that that is looking good. I can click finish. There we go. Look at that. That looks good. This thing is looking, it's really coming together quick. And now I'm going to do my final feature here. Once, Basically just rinse and repeat of what I just did exactly. So pick this edge here. Go to the edge flange command. Make sure the edge flange is kind of coming in towards the middle of the model. I'm going to say that I want the flange position to be bend on the outside. So uh, the entire bend down here on this. Uh, yep, like that. Entire bend down there outside. So material flush. One material thickness to the outside. Entire bend to the outside. Nice new note. It's good to see. And then I'm going to go here to edit flange profile. So here's edit flange profile. And uh, this is something, this is a, a sheet metal thing. Uh, this is a sheet metal thing. I actually talked about this at the world conference last year uh, during my sheet metal tips and tricks. So this is when we were live and in person. It's right at the beginning of the video. The video is on my channel. It's also on the SolidWorks channel. Uh, when you're in sheet metal, and this actually happens all throughout SolidWorks, you get what I call a, a soft relationship for convert entities. And what that means is that this line here is black, meaning it's fully constrained. And it will move with this edge here where it picked up the, the uh, convert entities relationship. But if you grab this line and you drag it, you can break that relationship. And it's, it's, it's something that I think bears uh, uh, or warrants maybe just a little bit more of a discussion so i'm going to click finish here on this flange and i'm going to just start a new part here real quick and i'm going to go to uh, top plane begin a sketch and i'm going to sketch two circles and this is really the easiest way to illustrate this so i'm going to make a circle here like so i'm going to make a circle here like so and i'm going to do extrude okay and now i'm going to go to the front plane begin a sketch i'm going to take this edge and convert it i'm going to take this edge here and i'm going to convert it now, the only reason I'm using a circle instead of a rectangle is just because it shows better. But this works with convert entities across the board. Um, it's, you know, again, these are like little nuances, but they can save you a lot of time if you, if you really learn how they work. Uh, so now I'm going to go back to this sketch and I'm going to make this circle larger. And you see, it's a dynamic relationship, right? The, the end point of this line knows that it should stick to the projected location of this circle. Um, in other words, if we look at this thing from a front view, right, the circle is projecting like this edge, the, the top edge is projecting onto the front plane. And, and so you get that, you get a line with two endpoints that are going to stay the same, uh, stay at the same location as the diameter of the circle dynamically, right? But whenever you do convert entities like that, you notice that the relationship is on the line itself, not the two endpoints. And the two endpoints kind of pick up this, this like soft relationship where I can actually take this point and drag it over here. And I can take this point and drag it over here like this. And now if I was to repeat the, the uh, example I gave a moment ago and make this small again, well, I broke up that converted relationship. Um, it's something that I first noticed in sheet metal, but it's something I've gotten a lot of use out of over the years, a lot of mileage out of over the years, uh, and definitely something to look out for. I call that a soft relationship in convert entities, and um, and it happens, you know, it, it'll obviously it'll happen with rectangular geometry as well. It's just not as easy to show, uh, just graphically. Uh, I mean, it's easy easy peasy to show. It's just graphically, it's not as easy to show. Um, so, for example, here, if I pick this face, begin a sketch, and pick this edge here, and I say convert entities. It's going to dynamically update, but I have the flexibility to grab this point and drag it off. 
grab this point and drag it off. So if, for, if, uh, for example, I wanted something that uh, was a little bit shorter than the overall length, but I wanted it to be hooked to the, the curved edge, uh, when this gets linear edge, you can do that with convert entities and kind of break that up easily. Now, one thing to, to be aware of and not to mix this up with is if I do convert entities here on all four edges, well, this point is now locked, right? Because it's, it's held at the intersection of this line and this line, and this line's linear location is defined, and this line's linear location is defined. So it only works when you have a free endpoint, which that endpoint is currently black, which means that if I was to edit the sketch of the rectangle and make the rectangle smaller, that uh, endpoint is going to move with it. But if I jump back into that sketch now and I grab this endpoint, I can just whoosh, drag it right off there. No, don't have to delete a relationship or anything. Soft relationship. I don't know what it's officially called. That's just what I call it. Okay, so we got a couple of final dimensions here. This is a dimension of two inches. So S key, smart dimension. Um, most of the time when I dimension, I try to go from a line to a line. Uh, certainly, I could just pick this line here, but I don't feel like it's as strong. So I try to try to keep things strong. You know, if I adjust this model at all, I want to know that it's going to it's going to rebuild properly. Uh, what's the depth of that thing? 1.5 from the outside. OK, so from there to there, that's our 1.5. Okay, exit sketch. There's our flange. Uh, select this flange, begin a sketch, orient my view, S key circle, single click, move my mouse away, make that 0.5 through, S key uh, center line. I'm gonna drop a center line in here like so. Uh, make sure that that's horizontal. Where's my horizontal? There it is. Uh, S key smart dimension from here to the center line, cross over the center line. That lets me put in my dimension of 2.5 across the center line, and then a dimension here of one. Uh, which we could probably assume that this is centered, uh, but, you know. S key, extrude cut, right mouse button, through all. You could also do what's called link to thickness. When you do sheet metal, you get a linked dimension buried in the sheet metal, which is kind of cool. Uh, linked dimensions are uh, very useful in SolidWorks in general. They allow you to do things like um, when you're creating a model like this, Let's say we wanted this model to have a uniform wall thickness. We could take a dimension like this. Uh, here you go. Here's 19. And we could right mouse button on that dimension and say link value. And we could call this uniform wall thickness. Okay. And then we could go to another dimension, like the width of this wedge, and right mouse button. And we could say link value. And then from our pull down menu here, we can choose any values we've linked before so you could have like five different values so in mold design uh shout out to mike puckett uh you would often do this for uniform wall thickness and for draft angle because you often have a lot of different features with draft angle and you want it to be the same on all of them and then if the tool maker comes back and says hey can you change that from 1 to 1 1.5 you only have to change it in one spot and so now if i rebuild uh, we will see that if i change this this here from 19 to say 10 and rebuild it changes it both on the wedge and the plate there. And then similarly, I could take this guy here and I could uh, right mouse button and say link value and then link that to uniform wall thickness as well. And control Q and there we go. Now we have uniform wall thickness for all of those features. Now, the reason I, I wanted to take a moment just to mention that is because what happens in a sheet metal design is that you automatically get a linked value called thickness shows up here it's it's kind of special in sheet metal um, because it's called exactly thickness and it just uh, kind of appears magically as soon as you choose to create a sheet metal design and then from from that point on anytime you go to create a cut extrude instead of making the cut extrude through all where it just blasts through the entire model you could do link to thickness so you're you're guaranteed it's only going to go through one wall and it's it's static right which which we talked about a moment ago so it's going to rebuild faster well, here's something kind of cool that you can do. Um, you'll notice here that this says thickness. Uh, it says link to thickness, right? And you'll notice here that when I, when I look at the equations in SolidWorks, there's an equation here that's called exactly thickness. Now, I always like to take note that there's a capital T. I don't know if it actually matters, but I always make mine with a capital T. And so what we can do is we can make a new part here. 
and we can go to our top plane and we can say that we want to create a centered rectangle with a uh, depth of, oh, I made it in inches by accident, sorry guys, uh, 1.5 by five and S key extrude and let's bring that up to a height of 0.5 inches, right? And then let's double click on, uh, or, or let's, sorry, let's do this. Let's go over here to this end, begin a sketch. I'm gonna create a, a tombstone shape sticking up here or that doesn't have to be tombstone. Just make a rectangular plate here. So I'll make this 1.25 by 0.675 and I'm gonna go S key extrude and you'll notice over here, it just looks like a regular extrusion menu. You'll notice specifically in this region, it just says merge result, right? So remember that for uh, about a minute from now. So I'm gonna uh, go back to my first feature. I'm gonna double click on this first feature. I'm gonna right mouse button on 0.5. I'm gonna say link values, and I'm gonna call this exactly thickness, T-H-I-C-K-N-E-S-S, -S, thickness. Well. SolidWorks, uh, whenever it goes to do an extrusion, uh, whether it's boss extrude or a cut extrude, SolidWorks is looking to see if there is an equation in here and if there's an equation called thickness. And if there happens to be one that's called exactly thickness, something kind of cool happens. When you go into the boss extrude command, you get this option here for link to thickness, even though it's not sheet metal, it just shows up there. So now anytime I go to make a boss extrusion, I can say I want it to be linked to thickness. So I'll make another one over here. I'll say, I'm gonna make another boss extrusion here like so. Extrude, link to thickness. And then what I could do is I could go to any one of those dimensions and change that value. And it's gonna change it on all three of them. I can go to this one. This is the cool thing about link value is that it's uh, omnidirectional, I guess you would call it. Uh, so I'll go here, change the thickness, boom. How cool is that? It's just right there in the regular, like I'm just doing a regular boss extrude here. I'm just doing a regular SolidWorks model. So just like a little hack that I noticed a, uh, a few years ago back. Uh, yes, that is a Toby exploit. Uh, I've, I have seen other people since I discovered it, or not discovered it, since I discovered it for myself. I have seen other people present it uh, at, at like tips and tricks events and things like that. But it's kind of cool, especially if you're doing a lot of stuff that needs uniform wall thickness, whether it's... Uh, plating, you know, metal work. Um, probably it would even work in weldments. I never tried it in weldments, but it would probably work there too. Uh, if you just needed to have like all uniform plates. Lumber, that's where I've used it is uh, lumber where I want everything to be cut to the same thickness. Link to trickness. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And Milton says that's new to me. That's awesome, Milton. Glad we could share that one as well. All right, guys, I'm running, I'm running down the clock here. Oh, my mind is blown. That's awesome. Thanks, Milton. That's all I can ask for. All right, I'm going to do a mirror all here. Uh, we've talked about mirror all in the past, but it's basically you're doing mirror bodies. Uh, and then you can see here uh, that we're going to just pick the body. You can do this with sheet metal. It's kind of cool. You can just mirror the whole thing across. And I am going to now roll back because I forgot to add my fillets. So S key fillet. Um, I always try to remember where the cursor focus is. So the cursor focus is on the radius when you first launch the fillet command. So that's a good way to save a little bit of time because as soon as you get in here, you can just type in 0.25 and then we can go one, two, three fillets at 0.25. Right mouse button to finish that and then S key fillet again. Cursor focus is on the radius. And so I'm gonna make that a radius of one inch and then I will hit this corner here. Let's roll forward. Let's take a look at the mass of this part, evaluate mass properties. And this is gonna be at 0 0.53 pounds, which actually I think is incorrect. I think it's supposed to be like four, four, seven something. What did I miss? What looks wrong here? So we're gonna do the quick look over at this thing. I feel like this this is too big. Is that what I missed? No, 1.5, two, yep, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, this is the fun. 1.3, uh, 3.75, yep, that's good, yep. What I missed, I missed something here. 37, four inches from the back. 0.375, materials correct, 1060 alloy. Rebuild everything. 0.53, that's not right. Need a hole cut, thank you. Appreciate that, Tambor Station. That is correct. Need a hoe cut. <laughs> Thank you. Giant giant hole right in the middle of the part. Totally missed it. You guys tuned in to see a pro. This is what you get. All right, here we go. Make this guy vertical. 
And we'll make this guy like sta literally staring me right in the face. Make this guy uh, two inches off the top. S key extrude cut. And we can just do length to thickness here. And let's try this again. Mass properties. That looks a little bit better. 0.47. All right. So it looks like it's looking for three decimal places. Let's go into our options here. Set this to three decimal places. 0 0.472 pounds. Let's see if we got it correct. Now that we got that giant hole in there. There we go. We did it. 0 0.472. Yes. All right. Yeah, shout out to Mike Puckett. He says, if you guys learned something, hit the like button. Let's see if we can get this thing up to 10 likes. <laughs> you know, says, good thing we ain't paying. Yeah, good thing you're not paying for these parts. I would have sent you this part with that hole totally missing. All right, guys, five minutes. Here we go. We're going to speed run this last one. We've got five minutes left. If you like speed runs, you're going to love our 3D CAD modeling speed run tournament. We did it last year in June. Our winner was Ivan. We did it last year in December. Our winner was Cam Smith here in the chat today. We're going to do it again in summer on May 1st, Saturday, May 1st. So if you guys are around Saturday, May 1st, be sure to tune in. It's a lot of fun. I will do a much better job promoting it next time around. Here we go. Final model here. This is what it looks like, hinge plate. I'm going to put this on full screen in case anybody wants to screen capture it. Once we screen capture it, we're gonna go. We're gonna go for it. We're gonna try and finish this thing in five minutes. We're gonna just blast through this thing. Take a quick sip of my water. <laughs> all right, here we go, guys. Appreciate all the chat. Appreciate all the chat for sure. All righty. Here we go. Hinge plate. Uh, starting plane. Starting profile. Uh, something like this, I'm probably going to attack this thing from a side view. Uh, might include the, the chamfers, might save them for a subsequent feature. Then I will probably create this kind of larger rectangular boss on the bottom that's sticking out a little bit further. Maybe in one big feature, maybe in two separate features. And then once I have that geometry in place, it's probably just a matter of adding this cutout and I'm good to go. I mean, you could definitely probably do this in three features. I might do it in a few more, but you could probably just do this thing in three features really. I think on I think I was trying to give everybody a little bit of a break on Saturday. I gave you guys a lot of tricky parts. So I wanted to give everybody a break. But in true two tall Toby fashion, we got about six different answers as the first six answers. Uh, so not not entirely easy. None of these are entirely easy. MMGS plain carbon steel. Right plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, S key, line, come across here to a depth of sixty-four. Come up here to an unknown height. Come across at an angle of 30, which we just kind of have to eyeball up here. Come across like so. Close off that sketch. Uh, that sketch is going to... I'm looking to see if, this is, if it's specified how high that is. It's 38. Uh, you know what? I should probably include... Just because of how this thing is dimensioned here, it's dimensioned with this 38, I should probably just include this step in that first sketch. That's what I'm going to do. No big deal. Ain't no thing. A couple of different ways we could do this. What I would probably do is I would come down like so um, and then come across like this. And then what I would do is I would trim. We saw trim a moment ago, right? So I could trim this line here. And then what I can do is you can use trim to extend as well. So I can grab this line and actually extend it down to that point, which is kind of cool, kind of cool to know about. Um, and then I can just shift the whole thing up. So that's a, a little trim extend trick that you could do. There's probably, a, you know, 50 different ways you could address that situation, but that's how I did it. All right, here we go. 64, yes. Here to here is 38. Yes. Uh, we 10. From here to here is 10. From here to here is 25. Uh, let's see here. This one is 19 from this line to this point. 19. And then 30 from here to here. 30. S key extrude. This is going to go out to a depth of 78. Enter. Enter. 
I love that enter enter. Uh, pick this face here, begin a sketch, orient my view. Uh, this is kind of a cool trick that you can do with rectangles is you can single click here, move your mouse over. You can type in the uh, uh, the height in direction one, so that's a height of 16, enter. And then you can just single click over here because I don't want to have a driving dimension of 25. I just want to have that coincident relationship. So you single click, there it is, fully defined sketch, S key, extrude, bring that out to two millimeters, enter, enter. Come over here to this side, begin a sketch, orient my view. I could probably have done this in one feature, but um, uh, I'm, I'm in panic mode. I gotta finish this thing. I gotta, I gotta win Model Mania. 11, enter, enter. And uh, then I can use that little offset trick again. But again, because I'm in panic mode, I'm gonna go reference geometry plane. I'm going to make a new plane here, which is offset at a distance of nine millimeters. Uh, flip offset so it goes in there. Single click on that plane. Begin a sketch and then control and the number eight for orient my view. Uh, just in this spot, I think that, that makes sense. Now the name of the plane is getting in the way of my corner. Love it when that happens. Uh, see here, using the, the geometry from the drawing, I can kind of figure out where I need to be for this line that comes over. Uh, it's going to come over here 10 millimeters. Uh, I'm going to come back and touch that end point and then come off with my arc here, which has a radius of 41. So you want to really try to leverage those uh, uh, auto dimension tools. They're really helpful. Uh, here you can see I just kind of left the sketch out in space, hit escape, and then grab this point and drag it over to there. That's another little shortcut you can use. And then this distance here is 25, which I could have just done with the auto dimensioning along the way. We're left with a nice fully defined sketch in one shot. Why did I miss it? Extrude cut, right mouse button, offset from surface. And then what surface is it going to be offset from this surface here? And what's the offset going to be? It too will be nine. I think that's it. Looks like it. Oh, nope. Missed some chamfers in the front. Here we go. I'm going to get paid on this job. I'm actually going to submit it correctly. Here we go. 45 degree chamfer at six millimeters. Six millimeters, 45. This edge and this edge. Little final spin around, make sure it looks like the print. Go here to evaluate mass properties. And we got 781.95. We're looking for this thing in XXX grams, so that should be 782. Correct answer, yes, we did it. A little bit over the wire, but pretty darn close. All right, woo, that one got my heart racing. So uh, again, guys, uh, make sure you tune in on Saturdays. If you're here for the first time, be sure. To, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you want to see kind of what it looks like when people are competing live, tune in on Saturdays. You can even try your own hand at it. We've got some amazing guests coming up as well. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the session tonight, give me a one in the chat. We've got some great guests coming up here. Uh, we've got the Slug Me guys coming in April 10th. So welcome to the Slug Me guys. Can't wait to see them again. I want to say thank you to all of you. This is not the correct date. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, let me switch it real quick so nobody notices now that I called attention to it. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, the most amazing chat ever. I do really appreciate all you guys. I missed you guys last week. Uh, thinking about you guys was the, the number one remedy to what ailed me. Uh, so I was able to get back here ASAP. Uh, but I really I really do appreciate all you guys tuning in. I hope you guys appreciate all these tips and tricks. And um, see, you redeemed yourself with that last part. Okay, thanks, Nuno. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. Glad you enjoyed watching this pro modeling. Thanks a lot, C-T-S-U-G, Steve. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Milton. Appreciate it. Table 36, great seeing you in here. 3167, awesome seeing you in here again. And what's up, Bill? Thanks a lot for tuning in. Great to see you in here as well. And I will see everybody on uh, Saturday, I think, right? Let's see. When is it? Saturday? Saturday, March 20th. So this Saturday, we're going to do another Saturday speed modeling where people can earn points towards the tournament. I hope you guys all have a great week. It was wonderful seeing everybody in here. I'll see you guys on Saturday. Bye-bye.